Ethiopia has been for 14 centuries a Christian island in a sea of pagans, Menelik letter to European powers. This country is mine and no other nation can have it, Menelik response to Italian protectorate. Over Ethiopia claim, when united, the victory is ours as many small pieces of bark can conquer an elephant, Menelik using Ptolemy's traditional saying. There was never a time when united that Ethiopians lost to an enemy in history. Speaking to war messengers, these are some of the speeches of the great Emperor Menelik. Menelik II, baptized as Sahel Mariam, was king of Shua from 1866 to 1889 and emperor of Ethiopia from 1889 to his death in 1913. At the height of his internal power and external prestige, the process of territorial expansion and creation of the modern empire state was completed by 1898. The Ethiopian Empire was transformed under Emperor Menelik. The major signposts of modernization were put in place with the assistance of key ministerial advisors. Externally, Menelik led Ethiopian troops against Italian invaders in the First Italo-Ethiopian War. Following a decisive victory at the Battle of Adwa, recognition of Ethiopia's independence by external powers was expressed in terms of diplomatic representation at his court and delineation of Ethiopia's boundaries with the adjacent kingdoms. Later in his reign, Menelik established the first cabinet of ministers to help in the administration of the empire appointing trusted and widely respected nobles and retainers to the first ministries. These ministers would remain in place long after his death, serving in their posts through the brief reign of Lygia Su, whom they helped depose and into the reign of Empress Zhu Dai II. Menelik was the son of the Shuan Amhara king Negus Haile Malakot, and probably of the palace servant girl Ejige Hulema Adyamo, he was born in Angolala and baptized to the name Sahel Mariam. His father, at the age of 18 before inheriting the throne, impregnated Ejige who then left her. He did not recognize that Sahel Mariam was born. The boy enjoyed a respected position in the royal household and he received a traditional church education. In 1855, the emperor of Ethiopia, Tawadros II, invaded the then semi-independent kingdom of Shua. Early in the subsequent campaigns, Haile Malakot died, and Solomon Miriam was captured and taken to the emperor's mountain stronghold, Amba Magdala. Still, Tawadros treated the young prince well, even offering him marriage to his daughter Oltash Tawadros, which Menelik accepted. Upon Menelik's imprisonment, his uncle, Haile Mikhail, was appointed as Shum of Shua by Emperor Tawadros II with the title of Married Osmic. However, Mary Dosmic Haile Mikhail rebelled against Tewadros, resulting in his being replaced by the non-royal Otto Bezabah as Shum. Otto Bezabah in turn rebelled against the emperor and proclaimed himself Negus of Shua. Although the Shuan royals imprisoned at Magdala had been largely complacent, as long as a member of their family ruled over Shua, this usurpation by a commoner was not acceptable to them. They plotted Menelik's escape from Magdala. With the help of Mohammed Ali and Queen Workichu of Wallow, he escaped from Magdala on the night of the 1st of July 1865, abandoning his wife and returned to Shua. Enraged, Emperor Tawadro slaughtered 29 hostages, then had 12 notables beaten to death with bamboo rods. King of Shua, Bezabez's attempt to raise an army against Menelik failed. Thousands of Shuans rallied to the flag of the son of Negus Haile Malakot, and even Bezabez's own soldiers deserted him for the returning prince. Abedo Menelik entered Ankabur and proclaimed himself Negus. Grief over Tewadros. While Negus Menelik reclaimed his ancestral Shuan crown, he also laid claim to the imperial throne as a direct descendant male line of Emperor Lebna Dengel. However, he made no overt attempt to assert this claim at this time. Marcus interprets his lack of decisive action not only to Menelik's lack of confidence and experience, but that he was emotionally incapable of helping to destroy the man who had treated him as a son. Not wishing to take part in the 1868 expedition to Abyssinia, 
He allowed his rival Kassai to benefit with gifts of modern weapons and supplies from the British. When Talwadros committed suicide, Menelik arranged for an official celebration of his death even though he was personally saddened by the loss. When a British diplomat asked him why he did this, he replied to satisfy the passions of the people. As for me, I should have gone into a forest to weep over. His untimely death, I have now lost the one who educated me, and toward whom I had always cherished filial and sincere affection. Afterwards, other challenges a revolt amongst the Wallow to the north, the intrigues of his second wife Bafana to replace him with her choice of ruler, military failures against the Arce Oromo to the southeast, kept Menelik from directly confronting Kassa until after his rival had brought an Abuna from Egypt, who crowned him Emperor Johannes IV. Menelik was cunning and strategic in building his power base. He organized Trigtang three-day feasts for locals to win their favor, liberally built friendships with Muslims such as Muhammad Ali of Wallow, and struck alliances with the French and Italians, who could provide firearms and political leverage against the emperor. In 1876, an Italian expedition set out to Ethiopia led by Marchese Orazio and Tainori who described King Menelik as very friendly and a fanatic for weapons about whose mechanism he appears to be most intelligent. Another Italian wrote for Menelik he had the curiosity of a boy, the least thing made an impression upon him. He showed great intelligence and great mechanical ability. Menelik spoke with great economy and rapidity. He never became upset, Chiarini adds, listening calmly, judiciously, and with good sense. He is fatalistic and a good soldier. He loves weapons above all else. The visitors also confirmed that he was popular with his subjects and made himself available to them. Menelik had political and military acumen and made key engagements that would later prove essential as he expanded his empire. Succession? On the 10th of March 1889, Emperor Johannes IV was killed in a war with the modest state during the Battle of Galabot. Metima, with his dying breath, Johannes declared his natural son, Dejazimik Mengesha Johannes, to be his heir. On the 25th of March, upon hearing of the death of Johannes, Negus Menelik immediately proclaimed himself as emperor. Menelik argued that while the family of Johannes IV claimed descent from King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba through females of the dynasty, his own claim was based on uninterrupted direct male lineage which made the claims of the House of Shua equal to those of the Elder Gondar line of the dynasty. Menelik, and later his daughter Zudai II, would be the last Ethiopian monarchs who could claim uninterrupted direct male descent. From King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, both Lai Su and Emperor Haile Selassie were in the female line. Yasu through his mother Shurega Menelik and Haile Selassie through his paternal grandmother, Tenigmwork Sahel Selassie. In the end, Menelik was able to obtain the allegiance of a large majority of the Ethiopian nobility. On the 3rd of November 1889, Menelik was consecrated and crowned as emperor before a glittering crowd of dignitaries and clergy by Abuna Matwos, Bishop of Shua at the Church of Mary on Mount Todo. The newly consecrated and crowned Emperor Menelik II quickly toured the north in force. He received the submission of the local officials in Lasta, Yeju, Gojjam, Wallo, and Begemder. Consolidation of power and defeat of the Italians. Menelik is argued to be the founder of modern Ethiopia. Before the centralization process he completed, Ethiopia had been devastated by numerous wars, the most recent of which was fought in the 16th century. In the intervening period, military tactics had not changed much. In the 16th century, the Portuguese Bermudez documented depopulation and widespread atrocities against civilians and combatants including torture, mass killings and large-scale slavery. During several successive Gada conquests led by Abba Geddes of territories located north of Genel, River Bali, Amhara, Gafit, Damit, Idol. Warfare in the region essentially involved acquiring cattle and slaves, winning additional territories, 
Gaining control over trade routes and carrying out ritual requirements or securing trophies too. Prove masculinity. Wars were fought between people who might be members of the same linguistic group, religion, and culture, or between unrelated tribes. Centralization reduced these continuous wars, minimizing the loss of lives, raids, destruction, and slavery that had previously been the norm. Menelik's clemency to Ras Mengesha Yohans, whom he made hereditary prince of his native Tigray, was all repaid by a long series of revolts. In 1898, Menelik crushed a rebellion by Ras Mengesha Yohans, who died in 1906. After this, Menelik directed his efforts to the consolidation of his authority and, to a degree, to the opening up of his country to outside influences. Menelik brought together many of the northern territories through political consensus. The exception was Goj Jam, which offered tribute to the Shuin kingdom following its defeat at the Battle of Mbabo. Most of the western and central territories like Jima, Welliga province and Chebo were administered by chiefs who allied their clan's army with the central government peacefully. Native armed soldiers of Ras Gobana Dak, Ras Mikhail Ali, Hepti Gurgis Dinigd, Balha Abanefso, and were allied to Menelik's Shuan army, which campaigned to the south to incorporate more territories. Beginning in the 1870s, Menelik set off from the central province of Shua to reunify the lands and people of the south east and west into an empire. This period of expansions has been referred to by some as the Agar Magnet, roughly translating to some type of cultivation of land. During his battles, he made tactical alliances with different groups and appointed Hab Georgis Denagd as minister of defense, who was of mixed Gurajoromo ancestry. The people incorporated by Menelik through conquest were the southerners Oromo, Sidama, Gurij. Walida and other groups, he achieved most of his conquests with the help of Ras Gobana's Shuan Oromos, who helped Menelik previously during his clashes with Goj Jam. In territories incorporated peacefully like Jima, Lika, and Waliga, the former order was preserved and there was no interference in their self-government. In areas incorporated after war, the appointed new rulers did not violate the people's religious beliefs and they treated them lawfully and justly. However, in the territories incorporated by military conquest, Menelik's army carried out atrocities against civilians and combatants including torture, mass killings, and large-scale slavery. Large-scale atrocities were also committed against the Dizzy people and the people of the Kaficho kingdom. Some estimates that the number of people killed as a result of the conquest from war Famine and atrocities go into the millions. Based on convergent subjugation approaches, cooperation between Menelik and Belgian King Leopold II were attempted more than once. The British journalist Augustus B. Wilde wrote after meeting Menelik, I had found him a man of great kindness, a remarkably shrewd and clever man and very well informed on most things except on England and her resources. His information on our country evidently having been obtained from persons entirely unfriendly to U.S. and who did not want Englishmen to have any diplomatic or commercial transactions whatever with Abyssinia, Ethiopia. After meeting him, Lord Edward Glycan wrote, Menelik's manners are pleasant and dignified. He is courteous and kindly and at the same time simple in manner giving one the impression of a man who wishes to get at the root of a matter at once, without wasting time in compliments and beating about the bush, so often the characteristics of Oriental potentates. Dot, dot, he also aims at being a popular sovereign, accessible to his people at all hours, and ready to listen to their complaints. In this, he appears to be quite successful, for one and all of his subjects seem to bear for him a real affection, Foundation of Addis Ababa. For a period, Ethiopia lacked a permanent capital, instead. The royal encampment served as a roving capital. For a time Menelik's camp was on Mount Entodo, but in 1886, while Menelik was on campaign in Harar, Empress Techu Betel camped at a hot spring to the south of Mount Entodo. She decided to build a house there and from 1887 this was her permanent base which she named Addis Ababa New Flower. 
Menelik's generals were all allocated land nearby to build their own houses, and in 1889 work began in a new royal palace. The city grew rapidly, and by 1910 the city had around 70,000 permanent inhabitants, with up to 50,000 more on a temporary basis only in 1917 after Menelik's death was the city reached by the railway from Djibouti. The Great Famine 1888-1892 During Menelik's reign, the Great Famine of 1888-1892, which was the worst famine in the region's history, killed a third of the total population which was then estimated at 12 million. The famine was caused by rinderpest, an infectious viral cattle disease which wiped out most of the national livestock killing over 90% of the cattle. The native cattle population had no prior exposure and were unable to fight off the disease. Wuchel Treaty On the 2nd of May 1889, while claiming the throne against Ras Mangesha Johannes, the natural son of Emperor Johannes IV, Menelik concluded a treaty with Italy at Wuchel in Walla province. On the signing of the treaty, Menelik said the territories north of the Marib Milish or Eritrea do not belong to Abyssinia, nor are under my rule. I am the emperor of Abyssinia. The land referred to as Eritrea is not peopled by Abyssinians, they are Adels, Beya, and Tigers. Abyssinia will defend his territories but will not fight for foreign lands, which Eritrea is to my knowledge, under the treaty. Abyssinia and Kingdom of Italy agreed to define the boundary between Eritrea and Ethiopia. For example, both Ethiopia and Italy agreed that Arafali, Halai, Seganeti, and Asmara are villages within the Italian border. Also, the Italians agreed not to harass Ethiopian traders and to allow safe passage for Ethiopian goods, particularly military weapons. The treaty also guaranteed that the Ethiopian government would have ownership of the monastery of Debra Bison but not use it for military purposes. However, there were two versions of the treaty, one in Italian and another in Amharic. Unknown to Menelik, the Italian version gave Italy more power than the two had agreed to. The Italians believed they had tricked Menelik into giving allegiance to Italy, to their surprise. Upon learning about the alteration, Emperor Menelik II rejected the treaty. The Italians attempted to bribe him with two million rounds of ammunition, but he refused. Then the Italians approached Ras Mangesha of Tigre in an attempt to create civil war. However, Ras Mangesha, understanding that Ethiopia's independence was at stake, refused to be a puppet for the Italians. The Italians, therefore, prepared to attack Ethiopia with an army led by Baratiri. Subsequently, the Italians declared war and attempted to invade Ethiopia. Menelik's disagreement with Article 17 of the treaty led to the Battle of Adwa. Before Italy could launch the invasion, Eritreans rebelled in an attempt to push Italy out of Eritrea and prevent its invasion of Ethiopia. The rebellion was not successful. However, some of the Eritreans managed to make their way to the Ethiopian camp and jointly fought Italy at the Battle of Adwa. On the 17th of September 1895, Menelik ordered all of the Ethiopian nobility to call out their banners and raise their feudal hosts, stating, an enemy has come across the sea. He has broken through our frontiers in order to destroy our fatherland and our faith. I allowed him to seize my possessions and I entered upon lengthy negotiations with him in hopes of obtaining justice without bloodshed. But the enemy refuses to listen, he undermines our territories and our people like a mole. Enough. With the help of God I will defend the inheritance of my forefathers and drive back the invader by force of arms, let every man who has sufficient strength accompany me. And he who has not, let him pray for us. Menelik's opponent, General Orest Baratiri, underestimated. The size of the Ethiopian force, predicating that Menelik could only field 30,000 men. Despite the dismissive Italian claim that Ethiopia was a barbaric African nation whose men were no match for white troops, the Ethiopians were better armed, being equipped with thousands of modern French rifles and Hotchkiss artillery guns together with ammunition and shells which were superior to the Italian, rifles and artillery. 
Manalik had ensured that his infantry and artillerymen were properly trained in their use, giving the Ethiopians a crucial advantage as the Hotchkiss artillery could fire more rapidly than the Italian artillery. In 1887, a British diplomat, Gerald Portal, wrote after seeing the Ethiopian feudal hosts parade before him, the Ethiopians were redeemed by the possession of unbounded courage, by a disregard of death, and by a national pride, which leads them to look down on every human being who has not had the good fortune to be born an Abyssinian Ethiopian. The emperor personally led his army to attack an Italian force led by Major Toselli on 7, December 1895 at Buda Hill. The Ethiopians attacked a force of 350 Eritrean irregulars on the left flank, who collapsed under the Ethiopian assault, causing Toselli to send to companies of Italian infantry who halted the Ethiopian advance. Just as Toselli was rejoicing in his apparent victory, the main Ethiopian assault came down on his right flank, causing Toselli to order retreat. The emperor's best general, Ras Makanen, had occupied the road leading back to Eritrea and launched a surprise attack which rooted the Italians. The Battle of Amba Alagi ended with an Italian force of 2,150 men losing 1,000 men and 20 officers, killed. Ras Makanen followed up that victory by defeating General Arimondi and forcing the Italians to retreat to the fort at Mechel. Ras Makanen laid siege to the fort, and on the morning of the 7th of January 1896, the defenders of the fort spotted a huge red tent among the besiegers, showing that the emperor had arrived on the 8th of January 1896. The emperor's elite shown infantry captured the fort's well and then beat off desperate Italian attempts to retake the well on the 19th of January 1896. The fort's commander, Major Galliano, whose men were dying of dehydration, raised the white flag of surrender. Major Galliano and his men were allowed to march out, surrender their arms, and to go free. Menelik stated he allowed the Italians to go free as to give proof of my Christian faith saying his quarrel was with the Italian government of Prime Minister Francesco Crispi that was trying to conquer his nation, not the ordinary Italian soldiers who'd been conscripted against their will to fight in the war. Menelik's magnanimity to the defenders of Fort Meckel may have been an act of psychological warfare. Menelik knew from talking to French and Russian diplomats that the war and Crispi himself were unpopular in Italy. And one of the main points of Crispy's propaganda were allegations of atrocities against Italian Poes. From Menelik's viewpoint, allowing the Italian Poes to go free and unharmed was the best way of rebutting this propaganda and undermining public support for Crispy. Crispy sent another 15,000 men to the Horn of Africa and ordered the main Italian commander, General Orest Baratieri, to finish off the barbarians. As Baratiri dithered, Menelik was forced to pull back on the 17th of February 1896 as his huge host was running out of food. After Crispy sent an insulting telegram accusing Baratiri of cowardice, on the 28th of February 1896 the Italians decided to seek battle with Menelik. On the 1st of March 1896 the two armies met at Adwa the Ethiopians came out victorious. Equestrian statue of Emperor Menelik II, the victor of Adwa. The statue was erected by Emperor Haile Selassie and dedicated on the day before his coronation in 1930 in memory of his predecessor. With victory at the Battle of Adwa and the Italian colonial army destroyed, Eritrea was Emperor Menelik's for the taking but no order to occupy was given. It seems that Emperor Menelik II was wiser than the Europeans had given him credit for. Realizing that the Italians would bring all their force to bear on his country if he attacked, he instead sought to restore the peace that had been broken by the Italians and their treaty, manipulation seven years before. In signing the treaty, Menelik II again proved his adeptness at politics as he promised each nation something for what they gave end made sure each would benefit his country and not another nation subsequently. The Treaty of Addis Ababa was reached between the two nations, 
Italy was forced to recognize the absolute independence of Ethiopia. As described in Article 3 of the Treaty, Relations with Russia, Menelik began expanding Ethiopia's diplomatic ties, looking to Europe for a major power willing to enter into a relationship with the Ethiopian government. His sights soon settled on Imperial Russia, which proved amenable to Ethiopian attempts to establish a diplomatic relationship. During the visit of a Russian diplomatic and military mission in 1893, Menelik II concluded a Russo-Ethiopian alliance. As a result, from 1893 to 1913, the Russian government sponsored the visits of thousands of advisors and volunteers from Russia to Ethiopia. Among those who were sent were the Russian poets Alexander Bulatovich and Nikolay Gumilyev, both of whom developed close personal ties with Menelik. Russian support for Ethiopia led to the advent of a Russian Red Cross mission as medical support for the Ethiopian military. It arrived in Addis Ababa some three months after Menelik's victory at Adwa and established the first hospital in Ethiopia, Abolition of Slave Trading. By the mid-1890s, Menelik was actively suppressing the slave trade, ordering the destruction of several slave markets throughout the region and punishing slave traders with amputation. Both Tawadros II and Johannes IV had outlawed slave trading. But as not all tribes were against it, and as the country was surrounded on every side by slave raiders and traders, it was not possible even at the dawn of the 20th century to suppress the trade entirely. According to apologists, while Menelik actively enforced his prohibition, it was beyond his power to change the minds of all his people regarding the age-old practice, introducing new technology, after the Treaty of Addis Ababa was signed in 1896, Europeans recognized the sovereignty of Ethiopia. Menelik then finalized signing treaties with Europeans to demarcate the border of modern Ethiopia. By 1904, Menelik too was fascinated by modernity and like Tewadros before him. He had a keen ambition to introduce Western technological and administrative advances into Ethiopia. Following the rush by the major powers to establish diplomatic relations following the Ethiopian victory at Adwa, more and more Westerners began to travel to Ethiopia looking for trade, farming, hunting, and mineral exploration concessions. Menelik II founded the first modern bank in Ethiopia, the Bank of Abyssinia, introduced the first modern postal system, signed the agreement and initiated work that established the Addis Ababa Djibouti Railway with the French, introduced electricity to Addis Ababa as well as the telephone, telegraph, the motor car, and modern plumbing. He attempted unsuccessfully to introduce coinage to replace the Maria Theresa Thaler. In 1894, Menelik granted a concession for the building of a railway to his capital from the French port of Djibouti but Alarmed by a claim made by France in 1902 to control of the line in Ethiopian territory, he ordered a stop for four years on the extension of the railway beyond Dair Dawa. In 1906, when France, the United Kingdom, and Italy came to an agreement on the subject, granting control to a joint venture corporation, Menelik officially reaffirmed his full sovereign rights over the whole of his empire. According to one persistent tale, Menelik heard about the modern method of executing criminals using electric chairs during the 1890s, and ordered three for his kingdom. When the chairs arrived, Menelik learned they would not work, as Ethiopia did not yet have an electric power industry. Rather than waste his investment, Menelik used one of the chairs as his throne, sending another to his second leak Mekwiz or Abait Bayalu. Recent research, however, has cast significant doubt on this story and suggested it was invented by a Canadian journalist during the 1930s. Menelik reportedly spoke French, English, and Italian fluently. He read many books and was educated in finance, getting involved in various investments, including in American railroads and American securities and French and Belgian mining investments. 85. Menelik married three times, but he did not have a single legitimate child by any of his wives. 
However, he is reputed to have fathered several children by women who were not his wives, and he recognized three of those children as being his progeny. In 1864, Menelik married Woizero Oltash Tawadros, whom he divorced in 1865. The marriage produced no children. Oltash Tawadros was a daughter of Emperor Tawadros II. She and Menelik were married during the time that Menelik was held captive by Tawadros. The marriage ended when Menelik escaped captivity, abandoning her. She was subsequently remarried to Dijaz Machbarai Apalos of Adwa in 1865, the same year as divorcing his first wife. Menelik married the much older noble woman Woizero Baffina Wold Michael. This marriage was also childless, and they were married for 17 years before being divorced in 1882. Menelik was very fond of his wife, but she apparently did not have a sincere affection for him. Woizero Bafana had several children by previous marriages and was more interested in securing their welfare than in the welfare of her present husband. For many years, she was widely suspected of being secretly in touch with Emperor Johannes for in her ambition to replace her husband on the throne of Shua with one of her sons from a previous marriage. Finally, she was implicated in a plot to overthrow Menelik when he was king of Shua. With the failure of her plot, Woizero Bafana was separated from Menelik. But Menelik apparently was still deeply attached to her. An attempt at reconciliation failed. But when his relatives and courtiers suggested new young wives to the king, he would sadly say, you ask me to look at these women with the same eyes that once gazed upon Bafana, paying tribute both to his ex-wife's beauty and his own continuing attachment to her. Finally, Menelik divorced his treasonous wife in 1882 and in 1883. He married Techu Betel. Menelik's new wife had been married for times previously, and he became her fifth husband. They were married in a full communion church service, and the marriage was thus fully canonical and indissoluble, which had not been the case with either of Menelik's previous wives. The marriage, which proved childless, would last until his death. Techu Betel would become Empress Consort upon her husband's succession and would become the most powerful consort of an Ethiopian monarch since Empress Mentwab. She enjoyed considerable influence on Menelik and his court until the end, something which was aided by her own family background. Empress Techu Betel was a noblewoman of imperial blood and a member of one of the leading families of the regions of Semin, Yeju and modern Walo and Begender. Her paternal uncle, Dijaz Mach Wub Haile Mariam of Semin, had been the ruler of Tigray and much of northern Ethiopia. She and her uncle Ras Wub were two of the most powerful people among descendants of Ras Gug Zamursa, a ruler of Oromo descent from the house of Washik of Wallo. Emperor Johannes was able to broaden his power base in northern Ethiopia through Tetu's family, connections in Begemeter, Semin, and Yeju. She also served him as his close advisor and went to the Battle of Adwa with 5,000 troops of her own. From 1906, for all intents and purposes, Techu Betel ruled in Menelik's stead during his infirmity. Menelik II and Techu Betel personally owned 70,000 slaves. Abajifar also is said to have more than 10,000 slaves and allowed his armies to enslave the captives during a battle with all his neighboring clans. This practice was common between various tribes and clans of Ethiopia for thousands of years. Techu arranged political marriages between her Yeju and Semin relatives and Kishuan, aristocracies like Ras Wolda Jurgis Aboy, who was governor of Kaffa, Ras Mekanin, who was governor of Harar, and Menelik's eldest daughter Zudai to Menelik, who became Nigest Negestad of the empire after the overthrow of Lai Jiasu. Tetu's stepdaughter, Zhu Dai Tu, was married to her nephew Ras Gug Sawel, who administered Begemeter up to the 1930s. Previous to his marriage to Tetu Betel, Menelik fathered several natural children. Among them, he chose to recognize three specific children to daughters and one son as being his progeny. Menelik's only recognized son, Abedo Asfa Wasan Menelik died unwed and childless when he was about 15 years of age, leaving him with only two daughters. 
The elder daughter, Woizero Shorega, was first married to DJ's match Wadajo Gobina, the son of Ras Gobina Daki. They had a son, Abedo Wasan Sejd Wadajo, but this grandson of Menelik II was eliminated from the succession due to dwarfism. In 1892, 25-year-old Woi Zero Shorega was married for a second time to 42-year-old Ras, Mikhail of Wallow. They had two children, namely a daughter, Woi Zero Zin Bwork Mikhail, who would be married at the age of 12 to the much older Ras Bezabi Tekel Hamanot of Goj Jam, and would die in childbirth a year later and a son, Lai Jiasu, who would nominally succeed as emperor after Menelik's death in 1913, but would never be crowned, and would be deposed by powerful nobles in favor of Menelik's younger daughter Zhu Daitu in 1916. Menelik's younger daughter Zhu Dai to Menelik had a long and checkered life. She was married for times and eventually became empress in her own right. She was only 10 years old when Menelik got her married to Rasariah Selassie Johannes, the 15-year-old son of Emperor Johannes IV in 1886. In May 1888, Rasariah Selassie died and Zhu Dai to became a widow at age 12. She was married to more times for brief periods to Gwangal Zijai and Wubatnaf Sejd, before marrying Gugsawel in 1900 CE. Gugsawel was the nephew of Empress Teichu Betel, Menelik's third wife, Zhu Daitu had some children, but none of them survived to adulthood. Menelik died in 1913 and his grandson Iasu claimed the throne on principle of seniority. However, it was suspected that Iasu was a secret convert to Islam, which was the religion of his paternal ancestors, and having a Muslim on the throne would have grave implications for Ethiopia in future generations. Therefore, Iasu was never crowned. He was deposed by nobles in 1916 in favor of his aunt, Zhu Dai Tu. However, Zhu Dai Tu, aged 40 at that time, had no surviving children. All her children had died young, and the nobles did not want her husband and his family to exercise power and eventually occupy the throne. Therefore, Zudatu's cousin Rastafari Makanan was named both heir to the throne and regent of the empire. Zudaitu had ceremonial duties to perform and wielded powers of arbitration and moral influence. But ruling power was vested in the hands of regent Rastafari Makanan, who succeeded her as Emperor Haile Selassie in 1930. Apart from the three recognized natural children, Menelik was rumored to be the father of some other children also. These include Ras Baru Wold Gabriel and Dejaz Mekkabid Tesema. The latter, in turn, was later rumored to be the natural grandfather of Colonel Mengis Tahili Mariam, the communist leader of the Derg, who eventually deposed the monarchy and assumed power in Ethiopia from 1977 to 1991. On the 27th of October 1909, Menelik II suffered a massive stroke and his mind and spirit died. After that, Menelik was no longer able to reign and the office was taken over by Empress Teichu. As de facto ruler, until Ras Bitwadid Sema was publicly appointed regent. However, he died within a year, and a council of regency from which the Empress was excluded was formed in March 1910. In the early morning hours of the 12th of December 1913, Emperor Menelik II died. He was buried quickly without announcement or ceremony at the seal Bet Kidane Meherit Church, on the grounds of the Imperial Palace. In 1916, Menelik II was reburied in the specially built church at Badala Mariam Monastery in Addis Ababa. After the death of Menelik II, the Council of Regency continued to rule Ethiopia. Laiji Yasu was never crowned Emperor of Ethiopia and eventually, Empress Zhu Dai Tuai succeeded Menelik II on the 27th of September 1916. Legacy? The Adwa Victory Day is celebrated in March annually, and it would also inspire Pan-African movements around the globe. A desire to share in the glamour Menelik enjoyed after his victory over Italy may explain. An improbable Serb legend, recounted by English anthropologist Mary E. Durham, portraying Menelik and the Serb king of Montenegro as kinsmen. 
Based on little more than the similarity between the Ethiopian honorific Negus and the name of the Herzegovinian village, Jegushi, from which the Montenegrin royal family originated, when these Herzegovinis migrated to Montenegro, a large body of them went yet farther afield and settled in the mountains of Abyssinia, among them a branch of the family of Petrovich of Njegushi, from which is directly descended Menelik, who preserves the title of Negus and is a distant cousin of Prince Nicola of Montenegro. And to this large admixture of Slav blood the Abyssinians owe their fine stature, and their high standard of civilization as compared with the neighboring African tribes. Menelik was featured as the leader of the Ethiopian civilization in the New Frontier season Passive, the 4X video game Civilization VI. His ability, Council of Ministers, grants sizable benefits to cities founded on hills, and units fighting in hills.